Welcome everyone to uh, another uh, webinar of Visual Insights. Uh, for the ones that don't know me, my name is Ryan Harrison. I've been uh, training visual performance skills for the last 20 years. Uh, I work with a lot of professional amateur athletes, collegiate athletes of all different sports. Uh, do a lot in baseball, softball, um, race car driving, tennis, hockey, you name the sport. We've probably done some stuff in there. Um, this week we have a, a special guest again in baseball with uh, Dusty Watson. And Dusty and I go back quite a long time, uh, probably more than I realize, um, because we go back to our fathers going back to the 1970-something with the Kansas City Royals. So Dusty's father, uh, John, played with the Royals back then when my dad was working with them with what's called the Royals Baseball Academy at the time. And I got to probably know Dusty at some point in between there, but got to know Dusty really well when I started working with the Philadelphia Phillies um, God, I don't even know what year that was, Dusty. <laughs> but, but so I got to see Dusty go from manager of pretty much – well, I met him as a player, but he was a manager from um, rookie ball up in uh, Williamsport to low A to high A to double A to triple A. And for the last few years has been a coach up in the big leagues with, with the Phillies. And so I appreciate, Dusty, having you on. Um, is there anything you want to tell you a little bit, give us a little more about your background? Uh, I mean, you pretty much covered it right there. But, um, you know, I was lucky enough to meet your dad through my dad um, as a high schooler and started doing some visual training stuff back then. And then when I went to junior college out in California, would go down to Laguna to the, your dad's office and, uh, you know, we would uh, do some things, touching lights and all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, I, I used the visual training all the way through my professional career. And um, so that's how we, we became uh, – friends and, and and then our, our boys uh you took them on a couple of trips uh here and there when when you came in right. town so that's been neat so yeah we've we've been through a lot together and uh i've been at this uh for quite a long time now with you yeah you know dusty uh it, it's amazing we we're just talking about this and your experience um you have experience from being the son of a professional player to the playing in the mi minor leagues and playing up in the big leagues a little bit being you know up there and then coaching from the lowest level to the highest level. Um, man, you're the most well-equipped coach there is out there. Uh, and, and you're probably, at, at the same thing as I say, the most equipped, you're probably the most confused coach out there as well because you've seen so much and, and such a variety of stuff that you know, as we all know, there's not one way of, of perfection out there to being, being a great player. Yeah, I think definitely. I think, um, you know, luckily for me, I went to – you know, junior college to play in college and had no, didn't quite know at the end of junior college where I was going to play, went to the Cape Cod League and ended up um, signing out of the Cape Cod League and, uh, you know, started in rookie ball there and, and kind of chipped my way all the way through the Mariners organization, became a free agent, bounced around a couple places, uh, luckily ended up in AAA in, in Omaha and uh, AJ Hinch and Brent Main's wives were due on the same day in September and the Royals didn't call a catcher up and so uh, I got a, a chance to go up and, and play in a couple games in the big leagues and then, you know, played a few more years. So, you know, 14 years in the minor leagues. And I think I'm, I think I'm right around 14 or 15 of, of coaching now. Um, so it kind of feels really strange to think like my playing days were 14 years and now I've coached for 14 years. And now we're at the point where I thought I played a long time and you look back and you didn't play at all. And now I'm at that point coaching. I'm thinking, wow, you know, ho hopefully I can do this for, for, maybe hopefully 14 more years and maybe longer. And, uh, you know, it was, it was neat to be able to do everything at every level, basically playing all the way through and then going back and starting over um, managing at the lowest level, because I think those experiences are so valuable with your people skills, you know, just, you know, what I've been through as a player and I can tell guys I've been through this same thing, whether it's, you know, something with a roommate or who knows what could happen. You know, I, I've been through all that stuff with, with you guys. And now to get to the big leagues as a coach, um, you know, it's been, it's been a pretty good ride and, you know, hopefully it's not over for a while. Well, now you also have a new, new ride coming up is because you got your sons getting older and playing. You got one going to be going off to college in a year or so. And, you know, maybe yeah. at some point you get to manage him. Won't that be a great experience? <laughs> yeah, that would be something. I mean, I think, uh, you know, he's excited. He's going to university of North Carolina at Charlotte. Uh, we live in Charlotte, so it's kind of uh, really nice for him. His little brother that's 10, we'll get to go up and see him. It's on the other side of town, so it's about 40 minutes. Mom will get to go see all the games. Uh, they're on TV or stream, so 
luckily I'll be able to get to see him uh, along the line. So yeah, it, it, it'll be fun. I mean, uh, we do a lot of baseball, but we play a lot of other sports. So we got a little batting cage in our backyard. So we've been hitting a little bit. So we're trying to keep sharp and keep my arm loose. So when we get back at it, it I'm ready to go too. Cool. Now, you know, uh, I have a couple thoughts here, but going back to one of your entry things is your experience with my dad and learning some of the stuff from my dad. Um, you know, that was back in Laguna Beach and beautiful views back then. <laughs> they still are. But, um, you know, thinking about that, that time period, um, you know, your, your dad experienced something that was very unique, um, starting with the Royals Baseball Academy that still has probably not and probably would never will be the same the way it is, but, you know, player development still improving, getting there differently, but vision tends to be something that a lot of teams don't talk a lot about. And you were uh, encouraged at a young age from your father because he experienced it at that high level, but also for you, you've experienced it at all different levels and, and you've seen it through players across uh, as a manager too. Where, what are some of the thoughts that you have as the importance of vision as it relates to improvement or the next level of baseball? Well, I think it's amazing how many guys get to professional baseball and we ask them, you know, oh, can you see that? Or can you see this? And they're, they can't see very well. I mean, it just happened with us not long ago with one of our catchers in the minor leagues that, you know, he had a terrible game. We were actually, we were in big league camp this year and we were at the new Atlanta place. It was one of their first, first or second night game. He was terrible. Couldn't catch the ball figured out I said what is wrong he says well I'm not wearing my contacts I don't always wear them I'm like what, what are we doing like and that's just the, the basic that's something that anybody can do not talking about visual training and all those other things but the visual training side of it is uh, I think it's huge um, because I mean if you can't see or if you're not at the top of your game with your visual side of things it doesn't matter how good or how fast you can swing a bat or how hard you can throw it or or how, how you how good your hands are if you can't see the ball and, and depth, per, depth perception and, and things like that, it's not going to matter what those other tools are. So for me, it's start, a lot of it starts with the visual side of, of sports. And I mean, I think it's, I was really lucky to get into it. And I think honestly, it really, really helped my career. Um, I'm probably not where I am right now without some of that stuff. I think uh, it, it was, you know, at the time cutting edge and it's, <laughs> It's not, it's, you're, you're so much farther past that stuff uh, than where we were, you know, in, in the, in the nineties, early nineties, I guess it was um, late eighties when I kind of started doing it. So, uh, I mean, I can't say enough about how important I think it is and how little um, some organizations and some sports put on it. I mean, I think it's, it's so important that, uh, you know, I can't believe that more teams don't have full-time guys. I mean, I was just talking with somebody the other day, uh, Ryan about, you know, they asked, did the Phillies have anybody? And I said, well, we don't really, but a lot of guys have kind of somebody on the side or, or something, because I think a lot of the, a lot of the guys know how special it is. I think you and I were just talking earlier um, about Sean Casey, you know, his dad reaching out to you when he was in high school or, or in college at Richmond uh, when Sean and I played together in the Cape Cod league. And, you know, that's something that, you know, to get every advantage you can in sports, uh, we all know how tough it is, you know, just to make your high school team, then to go on and try to play college and then professional uh, in any sport. I mean, whether that's softball, baseball, basketball, hockey, um, you know, that funnel gets tight up there at the top. So, I mean, if you want to get some kind of advantage I mean, and we're in a time right now when you're going to try to figure out how to get an advantage, um, eyesight, eye training is, is something you can do all the time anywhere. You know, uh, Dusty, it was, we had a good time, uh, when we were working with the Phillies and you guys were there and running around with the minor leagues and the, um, uh, you know, traveling around and stuff. And, and I actually, you know, get reached out by former players who thought it was so much helpful to them. In fact, uh, Fidel Hernandez uh, just had reached out to me recently and, and just said how great it was to help them. And even, um, um, shoot, why did I just went blank? Uh, the infielder with the um, Padres, the um, cast, not Castro, it was came up with the Phillies, the second baseman. Um, is it over with Padres, jumped around. Shoot, I'm trying to play. But he just ordered a Max BP the other day because those are things we were doing back then. And it's, it's funny, you know, sometimes it takes age and wisdom yeah. for them to realize that this was such an important part of their game. And when they're young, 
they think, oh man, I just got to swing. I got to put all this stuff and I got to put all this work in. Yeah, I see. I see. But the, but the guys, the true separators are the ones who give themselves the best visual information to allow their body to react to what they need to. Yeah, uh, no doubt. And I think um, oh, Derek Hall is one of them that still uses, I mean, I think you guys, I don't know how he connected with you guys, but he uses a lot of your stuff. Um, you know, he has uh, the targets and he puts them on his bat before he goes and hits, I noticed. And, uh, you know, different guys do different things, but I, I, I know, I know he's, he's been with you somewhere along the line when I saw the targets on his bat. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, everyone's got to find their way. And the thing is, even if they don't go through us, but having that visual, uh, uh, you know, desire, the, the ability to see and, you know, it, it's more than just the clarity. It's more than just the depth perception. It's how they apply it on that field. But even going back to clarity, like you brought up with your catcher, you know, I just read an article on Jameis uh, Winston and um, he just had LASIK surgery to get his eyes cleaned up. And his comments were, oh yeah, I could see, but you know, man, I could really see, but it didn't affect my game, but I can see better now. But but my depth perception was off before, but it didn't matter. And it's like he did all this, but he still doesn't understand the value of being able to see and, and react. And I think that sometimes with athletes, is they just think they can just go and do, um, and they take that vision for granted. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think so many people, I think just in general, people, you know, you don't have the right prescription in your glasses. And, you know, I can see what I need to see, I think. You know, and you don't realize what you're missing uh, until you do something like that. And I think – the visual training part of it um, is the next level. I mean, obviously you need to get your, your eyes to where they can see the best they can, but you go and look at the guys in the big leagues, they all have great eyesight one, and it's not natural. A lot of them, you know, have had Lasix or contacts or whatever, um, but they're also, they're doing something else. A lot of them are doing something else. You go and test them and it's, you know, they're, they're special athletes, but they're special in a lot of other different ways. And, and there's ways to train that. And, it's just amazing to me that it's not trained more. Yeah, it, it, I, as we know, it's, it's a little missed opportunity. Now, you know, look at all those years of coaching, and you've seen a lot of players that go through. And even when I was working, I remember players that were Phillies, but guys played against are in the big leagues now. What, what are some of the things that, that you know, there, there's, there's definitely some players that you probably saw back then that said, I don't think he'll make it, and he made it. And there's some guys that you saw that, like, man, this guy's going to make it. He's got an opportunity. And there's probably some guys you thought that should have that didn't. But, but maybe what are some of the things that you see in players that go, wow, that guy, that guy has a chance to, to make it? Well, it's funny because we talk about routine a lot. And, you know, that starts when you wake up every day. Um, you know, I'm obviously with the pro guys now. But, um, you know, I notice it with – with, with my kids. And, and when they're in a good routine, everything's smooth and good. And, and it's, it's great. But you notice that the guys that have a lot of success and I'll just give, and nobody wants to hear the, the, the examples of the superstars, but those are the ones that are doing the things the right way that make it, you know, Aaron Nola, the first day I met him, I was like, Oh my God, this kid's going to be unbelievable. Almost before I saw him pitch, because you could tell he does everything in the same routine every week. Reese Hoskins, same thing. He does everything same routine, you know, and now I've been around Harper for a year and, and he's same way. These guys, their routine is unbelievable. And, you know, I think the quicker that you can get on a routine uh, and stay on the routine, I, it's funny. So Cal Ripken to me is probably the best routine guy ever. And I was told I was about eight years into pro ball. And I was told that Cal Ripken gets up at nine o'clock Eastern every, every day. And so I was like, well, let me try this. And that year I felt my body felt better than, anything and I wasn't traveling all over the country I was in AAA on the east coast so I was in one time zone so it should be fairly easy for me other than you know sometimes you get in at five in the morning but you still got up at nine o'clock and then if you needed a nap before you went to the yard you did that but I think to me that is is so important the routine of of doing things every day kind of the same um depending on what day it is you know with pitchers obviously they have different things and you know starting pitchers especially but I think the routine part of everything is, is so important. I, I see, you know, my kids, like I said, they get into routines. My, my son in high school, like when he's in his routine, he does his homework, he, you know, he, he goes to practice, he does everything, and it's easy. As soon as you get out of that routine, they're yeah. all screwed up. I mean, I think we're all living that right now. Yeah, we're all living that right now <laughs> because myself. Uh, everyone's routines got messed up and, yeah. and th things have changed. And, uh, 
and we're all trying to figure out how to adapt. And, but that's and, a big thing, though, because now you, can't wait. Set, you need a new routine, right? Now you have to re, you have to set a new routine, and, and we've tried to do it around our house. But I think, you know, talking to some of our players through this and, uh, you know, they were just – we were just swept right out of our routine. I mean, we were about a week away from going, go time, and, you know, next thing you know, there's nothing. And it was the weirdest thing. Well, now – you know, the really good ones have figured out, okay, let me get this routine going. Let me do this to make myself better during this time. Let me figure out what I can do to make myself better. Um, you know, whether that's, I'm just going to do, you know, 200 push-ups a day, or, you know, I'm adding a push-up every day, or um, I'm adding something every day, you know, whether it's, you know, adding one visual thing, one physical thing, maybe I'm going to do one thing eating or something like that. But I think, you know, the routine, it has to change, but it has to be consistent. And you just have to, you know, adapt and overcome. Yeah, you know, that's a, it's a good point. And, and um, you know, even I think from the vision side of things, and this is where I think we break down a lot of times is not ha adding a visual component to their routine. And, you know, when, when I look at sport itself, I look at it in three components. We look at it with physical, the mental, and the visual. And you should have a physical routine, you should have a mental routine, and you should have a visual routine. And I think the guys at the high level, and, and I wouldn't say all of them, but guys who have consistent uh, approaches or, cons you know, you know, we talk about Sean Casey, he was career 300 hitter, which is rare. Um, they had a, a consistent visual approach, mental approach, and physical approach to the way they, they went about it. It adapted, but it was consistent at the same time. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, I like to talk about, especially with the visual routine, I like to talk about the hitters a lot because they'll do stuff early. But then to watch a guy, and I was lucky for, I think, maybe the last couple years I was in double A and, and maybe the year I was managing triple A, I would go up in September and be the extra coach in September. And I really didn't have any responsibilities once the game started. So I could just watch how guys acted on the bench. And I had never got that opportunity before because usually if you're managing, you're the manager in the game, coaching third base, you know, you got a lot of other things. You can't just kind of, observe and see what's going on so it was really neat to see you know Howard was still playing at the time um, you know Hoskins was kind of just kind of coming up so it was neat to see their routine as they went to the plate and how consistent it was um, the guys that were having success were very consistent with their routine and it was neat to see what they did you know Howard did a thing where he'd look at his bat look at a he'd pick a spot on the wall, look at his bat and do some eye exercise. I don't know if he's ever worked with you, but he's worked with somebody obviously, but he, he's, he's done a lot of things. So just to see those guys be consistent with that every at bat, um, it's pretty neat because you sit there and you watch, you go, the guy that's hitting 220 is just grabbing his bat and walking up there. The he's guys hoping, are having success. He's hoping to get a hit. Yeah. The guys are having success. They got a plan. They got a plan yeah. in place. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, <laughs> You bring up Howard. I have a quick uh, side story there. Um, you know, lucky enough to take my boys with me on some of the trips in the Philly clubhouse, and we're down in Lake Lakewood. And um, my youngest at the time goes. Ryan Howard was down there on a uh, rehab assignment, and my youngest son walks up to him and goes, "Did you get demoted?" <laughs> <laughs> to low A. So he, he he got a good laugh out of that. But but you know, that's good. He probably needed that at that yeah, point. Exactly. But you know, he did, and and. You know, some of these guys get away from having that plan, and I'm sure he got away from his plan there because you're searching for answers. And um, it's easy to get knocked off, but looking at some of the basics of going, okay, you know, we talk about this all the time. How well did you see the ball? And how well did you make a good decision off what you saw? And did you make a good reaction to it? And, you know, that helps answer a lot of questions, uh, hopes, wishes, and wants a lot of times. Yeah, I think – I think we're starting to see that too with, with our guys in the minor leagues, you know, there's, when I played, there was really never any, you never had a hitting coach or anything talk to you about, you know, swing decisions and things. It was all mechanics and doing this. And now we're seeing, you know, with the technology, the help of the technology is to be able to figure out, you know, swing decisions. Um, you know, are you swinging at pitches in the strike zone? Why are you not, you know, all these things. And I think that's, that's becoming more of a visual thing and, and a preparation thing than anything else. I, I think, you know, we still talk about mechanics, obviously, but we're, we're trying to hit the ball as hard as we can on a pitch in the strike zone that we can dominate. And I think you're seeing some of those training methods be carried over into the technology that we have now. Yeah. I mean, technology's uh, obviously played a huge role now. And, 
gives a lot of feedback and information on there. And, and it's, it's a positive, as you know, to many players, and it can be a negative to many players too in, in the way they approach certain things. And, you know, obviously to me, the, the players develop those numbers. They create those numbers and they have to go and do their task. And, and that's the key thing is they have to keep in, whether it's a, a little league kid to a golfer, but, you know, whatever player you are, you got to understand what is that task that you're trying to do. And basically you're trying to see a ball and then crush it, like you said, hit it as hard as you can, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that, that's what you have to figure out. I mean, uh, you know, you have to figure out what's going to work for you too. I think, you know, like we've got all this stuff, all this technology and things like that, but there's certain things that are going to work for you. I mean, I can remember, I know for a fact, the thing that I used from your dad for my whole career, and I still use it sometimes, I'm not even playing really, is the, you know, I don't know, I can't even remember what we called it back then, but but it was the broad focus, the fine focus, you know, grabbing grabbing the whole picture, grabbing a sign, grabbing the whole picture, going to the, the, the logo on the cap, and then going to where the, the ball was going to come out. And I mean, I used it, I think every at bat my whole life. And I still use, use that on at, at times, even though I don't really need to be hitting a ball anymore. No, but you know, the reason you use it is it's a way of we control our focus. And right. that's what you're trying to do is when you were getting your eyes to this release point, your eyes were fine tuned, focused on that, that ball. And that's where you see things best is you're sharp and clear when you're in that fine focus. So whether you're coaching, whether you're, whatever you're doing is, is you're fine tuning your focus at the right time. And if you find focus too long, you're, you're staring or you're thinking too much or you're trying too hard. And that's what happens with a lot of players is they're trying so hard that they get locked into too soon and too long that they never, they don't see real well. And right. so as a coach, you're doing the same thing. You're picking information up. You're playing dot to dot in a sense with your eyes, you're picking up the, 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 the necessary targets, but also sucking in that information and not just kind of randomly looking at where you're looking on there. Yeah, I think I think that's I mean, I think that sometimes gets confused sometimes by people thinking that players don't care. I, I think some some of the guys are so good at that of kind of distracting themselves, like you said, and, and not being in fine focus for so long and, and being in kind of a broad focus uh, and then getting into fine focus. It's you know, it's like the distraction of having fun. Like our guys had fun last year for a long time and we had a lot of success because they were distracted from, from the pressures of things, you know, it was just go be the guy that you are and play the game. And I think, you know, it's a good point that you say, you know, that, that we still use them for those reasons. And, you know, I still use them, like, like I said, and, and I don't even know why I use them, but you're explaining it to me. Thank you. I'll tell you another reason why I use it is, and we did actually do this with a, a minor league coach with the Phillies at the time. He was struggling throwing the BP because he was forcing his – he was looking at the target so hard, he was forcing the throw, and he couldn't throw, throw a strike. But when you, you know this, when you're at your best, you kind of look away and then pick up your target at the last second, and, and you let it go on there. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's the problem sometimes that the guys have with the throwing is they're so locked in on one spot that they can't handle it. And um, yeah. I've seen guys, you know, they try to find focus too long. <laughs> it gets ugly. Yeah, definitely. And, and you, I see it watching games. You know, I watch players and you could tell when they get in the box that they're in that what we call hard focus and they're locked in and you could see everything tighten up and you mm -hmm. just know that, they, that they're not relaxed. And you know, as a relaxed body, you're better, but also relaxed eyes, you're better. And that's a key point is getting your eyes relaxed and then get them on the task at hand at the given moment. Right. And that goes back to your routine of every guy needs his own routine or every girl needs their own routine of how to relax and how to get to that. Now, my, my, my routine is not going to be the same as somebody else. And, and how do I get to that relaxed state where I can just let my body take over? And, and you, I mean, that's part of, you got to figure that out and you need help from a lot of people to figure that out. I mean, that's, that's something that comes from yourself, but to me, um, that comes from a lot of like co coaches and trainers and strength and conditioning guys and listening to all the different people to try to figure it out. And some people figure it out sooner than others. Um, and, and those are the guys that, that, uh, you know, progress through their sport a little faster a lot of times. Yeah. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, we, we talk about these different kinds of routines, but your routine, maybe not yours, but as a player, your routine changes every level you go, go to. And probably the biggest change is, is that triple A to the big leagues or double A to the big leagues. 
it's a change in routine and, and the people that adapt are the ones who survive. The ones who can't adapt probably struggle through. Yeah. It's, it's funny that you say that because obviously the travel changes and all those things. So it, it is totally different, but what we tried to do as an organization is th- from the bottom to the top as we try to make things and we're getting better and better at it every year because we have more money to, to try to make things even um, is to try to get them in that routine as quick as possible because most of our guys come from high school or college and you know some high schools don't take batting practice you know colleges you play three or four days a week now we're we're playing every day and we're going to try to get these guys in routine and you know I use the example of video for myself as a player so when I was in the minor leagues Video was like one of the extra players holding a camcorder on guys. And then you had a couple swings somewhere along the line. And then when I started coaching, by the time I started coaching, well, end of my playing career, really, we had a lot of video in the big leagues. You got to the big leagues and there was all kinds of video everywhere, but you didn't have it really in the minor leagues yet. So what happened was you get to the big leagues or you get to AAA where it was really prevalent also, and you're trying to stay there so bad but now you have this whole new thing that's happening. All this video is going and it was something that was totally out of your realm. Like you haven't done it before. So it was all confusing. So now we went back and we, our video system. And now at every level, we have the, a video guy there uh, that also helps with advanced scouting stuff. And we try to make that so comfortable that when they walk into a ball to double a, they just need to meet a new video guy. They, the guy's going to do the same thing. They walk from double a AA to triple a, same thing, AAA to the big leagues, everything is streamlined and they don't have to change their routine as much. Um, they're going to have to change it because there's going to be some other things. But I think that was a thing that I stressed when I was managing the minor leagues was we have to make this as comfortable consistent. as possible and consistent as possible throughout the organization. So when they get there, it's so hard and so demanding when you get to the big leagues to try to stay there. Not many guys – they don't hand many guys jobs to say, here's yours. You're going to play 10 years. You got it, buddy. Most of them get there and you have to continue to, to, to keep going. And, and the special guys end up staying. And, you know, they say it's really hard to get to the big leagues, but really the hardest thing to do is to stay in the big leagues. Yeah. What, well, you know, I, I, I know some reasons, but curious why you think it's so hard to stay in the big leagues. So many distractions. Uh, I mean, there's so many things, um, you know, obviously now the change of, of, of things, the, 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 you know, video and people being able to, to make adjustments to each other. Um, but then the, the distractions too. No, people don't realize the distractions that happen instantaneously when you show up in the big leagues. You, you have friends from all over the country instantly. It's amazing. Yeah. This person wants tickets. That person wants tickets. Uh, I mean, there's just all kinds of things going on. Um, and also the guys there are really, really good. And it, it's, it's, it's distractions. Is a, it's really hard. Yeah. And you know, it, everything tightens up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're trying to prove yourself so every day. Yeah. I mean, I know like at the end of my, I think about my career was mostly in AAA. I think eight, nine years in AAA. And I know my last two or three years in AAA, when I knew I was getting close to being finished with my career, I knew I was so relaxed and so comfortable in AAA that I just, I mean, I did my routine and, and I was, you know, we, you'd be joking with hitters while I was catching and, um, you know, you were so comfortable because you'd been through this before you've been experienced and the experience is something funny because I remember I was with Seattle. Lou Pinello was our manager in the big <laughs> league and I was in triple a and everybody always said, Lou just wants, he just wants guys that have been around. He wants veterans. He won't give any rookies a chance. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. And the thing was the only reason you, you go back and think about it and now managing on the other side, I think about why was that? The reason was rookies get there and they're scared to death. They're so nervous. They're not playing like themselves. Veterans are comfortable. They've been through it before. They're, they're relaxed. You know what you're going to get. And as a player, I'm thinking that's crazy. As a manager who was in the minor leagues for a long time and is the big leagues, you're like, I get why he wanted veterans now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's always the catch 22. And and you see that Mm -hmm. is, Man, you want experience, but how do you get experience if you don't give me give me that chance? And you used to hear that from the players all the time. <laughs> they won't yeah, give me no doubt. Um, but, you know, and I always tell the guys, you know, I say, you know what? You all are going to get a window. I don't know what size window you're getting, but you're going to get one. So when you get that window, take advantage of it. Jump through it and don't come back through the window. 
Yeah. You know, the first round picks, the guys, you know, certain people are going to get huge, huge windows. Other guys are going to get a little tiny one. You know, for me, I had a little tiny, I was not drafted. You know, I had to prove myself every day um, and got lucky. Now, now looking back, um, you said 14 years of coaching now and, um, you know, in the big leagues last couple of years on there. If you look back at yourself as a manager with um, back in Williamsport, um, what, what are some of the things that you know now that maybe you would change uh, to make yourself a little bit better back then? Well, I think, you know, I don't know if I would change things per se, but I think, you know, I thought I did a pretty good job with the younger guys. And, and I think, I guess I don't, it's hard to say what you'd change because I, I think we did, I think I did a pretty good job and, and made guys comfortable. But I think the biggest thing that a lot of people do, and I hear it from players all the time is, is they don't let players be themselves. And that's a hard thing to juggle as a manager, especially in the minor leagues, when you have all these rules that aren't your own rules and, and the organization has their rules and you have to follow them. Um, but you want the players to be themselves and you want them to be comfortable in their own skin. I think the more comfortable you can get people, the better off, the better performance you're going to get from them. I think, you know, you make guys do this, do that because I said, so it's, it's not really, I mean, if you explain why and maybe you can get them to buy into it, but I think you have to get people to be comfortable and be themselves. And I think, you know, I, I kind of, figured that out as a player, you know, towards the end of, of watching some guys. I mean, I played with Brandon Phillips and if, if you would have tried to make Brandon Phillips, somebody else <laughs> yeah. it would have been terrible, but he I mean, was, he was, he was uh, I was ran on the field quite a few times for Brandon because, you know, he was yelling at somebody or didn't like what was going on and we had to go out there and, and, but I mean, that was Brandon and that was, that was how he was. So if you would have tried to, to shut that down, it wasn't going to work. It's like Griffey. If you would have made Griffey, you know, he would have been really good still, but if you would have tried to take that swag away from him and, and take that away from him, I don't think he'd be where he is now probably. Yeah, I was working with the Philly, I mean the Reds at the time. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about when he was over there and Brandon Phillips. Yeah. And, uh, they both. And, and I think that's a key thing that I think a lot of young coaches, especially when you, when you talk about Little League, is we're not allowing those kids to be comfortable. We're making them play like with fear and pressure and, and stress instead of letting them, you know, with confidence. And, and you know, I think that's, that's one thing I, I feel like that I learned from, from my dad is a lot of the stuff that we do from a vision perspective, giving these players visual confidence to allow their other confidence to come out. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, I played for two – I was lucky at the end of my career to play for two very different but very good managers. And John Russell – uh, was my last two years with Philadelphia who managed in the big leagues with Pittsburgh. And then Marty Brown, who made a pretty good career for himself uh, managing over in Japan for a number of years. And they were polar opposites. Um, but both of them let you be yourself in different ways. Marty wanted to fight everybody for you. John Russell never said a word. We always said for older people that he, he was EF Hutton. I don't know if anybody remembers those commercials, but EF Hutton, he would walk through the locker room and say like two words and everybody said, what do you say? What, 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 and you wanted to run through a wall for both those guys. And, and they both let you be yourself. And I think that's why, I mean, we had a lot of success at both places I was. And I think that's why, because, and I learned that like, oh, okay, um, this is why. I mean, we had a lot of success when I was with Cleveland. That's when we had a lot of those guys coming up. You know, Brandon Phillips was there and Sizemore and those guys. And we had this huge range of guys. You know, we had myself and Ernie Young, who were in our th early 30s. And we had Grady and Ryan Garko and, and, you know, Cliff Lee and these guys that were like in the early 20s that were going to be just studs, but they were all totally different. You know, Cliff's, Cliff's a redneck from Arkansas. Brandon's from, from Georgia wanting to fight everybody. And then you got Bra uh, Grady is from Seattle, who's just a laid back, whatever, dude. And he let us all be ourselves. And I think I learned that really fast that you got to let people be themselves, let them get comfortable. Yeah, that's <laughs> funny. It's funny. You bring all those names up. It brings back a lot of memories of, of different, yeah. different players there. Um, you know, as a, as a son of a major league player, uh, you have any cool, uh, experiences or, or stories? I mean, I know you, you have a lot of George Brett stories as well as I do, but yeah. some, uh, 
some taste some tasteful ones that can be said publicly. Uh, how 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 was it growing up as a son of a major leaguer and being around baseball all your life? Well, I mean, it was great, but I, I can tell you this. I didn't know any better. So, I mean, looking back, you realize, wow, it's pretty special um, to be, and I feel really lucky to be around the game my whole life. Um, I was born in double A when my dad was in Jacksonville. So basically born into baseball. Um, but I didn't know any different. Um, back then the game was totally different. I mean, I can remember coming, you know, being a little kid and after games, three, four guys coming over, George, Jamie Quirk, uh, you know, different guys coming over and hanging out, my mom cooking dinner for them, the guys sitting there having a couple beers after the game, and next morning I'd wake up and there are guys laying on the couch and, you know, they had to go to the ballpark the next day. So, I mean, those days are different. The guys really hung out a lot more um, together, the families. I mean, I grew up in Blue Springs, uh, which is about 10 miles from the stadium in Kansas City, and I think at one time on our Little League team, we had seven Royal Sons on the team because we all lived in this little suburb and – um, we all just kind of hung out together and went to school together. And, you know, some guys left for the winter, some stayed for the summer. Um, but it was just, it, it was what we did and we didn't know any different, but, uh, you know, a lot of great stories. I mean, uh, obviously George, like you said, was part of them. George and my dad were really good buddies and, uh, still are obviously. And, and, and I think George, um, he and George lived together in spring training for a number of years and stuff. So, you know, he'd come over for, uh, Thanksgiving, you know, things like that. He wasn't married at the time. I uh, didn't get married till later. So, I mean, I think probably the number one story, I mean, there's some good Thanksgiving stories where my mom bought a brand new white tablecloth one time for Thanksgiving. And George said, my dad's nickname is Duke. Duke, can you pour me some wine? He holds the wine out. It's red wine. And he starts pouring and George just pulls his glass away. He said, thanks. And just so my dad would pour it all over the rug. I mean, just things like that. He was a little kid, basically, you know, just messing around. You, you, you got a good laugh out of those, probably. Yeah, I mean, just like uh, it, George says to this day, like when George's boys were of age to be babysat, he said, you'll never babysit my kids because there's no way <laughs> no, I'm going to let you be around my kids. From what you've seen from me, there's no way you're going to be around my kids. That's um, funny. Yeah, there's, I mean, there was, there's, but I think the number one probably thing that I'll always remember was, uh, 1985, they win the World Series. Um, we're standing outside. Obviously, the, the way that things were celebrated is a lot different than it is now. And they're all celebrating in Kansas City. So um, Dean Vogelar comes out. He's the traveling secretary, PR guy. Uh, and he says, all right, to my mom, all right, the wives can go in now. And my mom looks at him. She goes, no, no, my boys are going in way before I'm going in there. And that was how it was because we all grew up as little kids running around the clubhouse and that doesn't happen that much anymore. And yeah. so we got to go in and celebrate. And I mean, I can remember getting thrown in laundry carts and spun around and getting beer poured on me at, you know, what I was like 12 years old. Uh, yeah. You know, that's just what you did. It wasn't, it was no big deal. It was just, it was part of it. And uh, we were probably almost just as much a part of that club and as a part of that organization as, as anybody around there that was working there or anything like that. Cause I mean, here we go, here, here we were all these kids running around the ballpark shagging and hitting in the cage and, you know, getting in trouble. And we were there just as much as everybody else. So that's probably the best one uh, was, was an 85 from the world series. So, so let me ask this as growing up as a son of a, a professional player and being around the game a lot, and there's a lot of kids who uh, have done that and now are playing in the big leagues or, or getting all that experience. And then we have on the other side, we have, you know, all these hitting lessons and mechanical lessons and uh, throwing lessons and lifting and, and all these different things. And obviously time has changed and technology has changed over, over many years. But, you know, I, I, I guess part of my point, I think you breathing and just throwing the love of that game was probably a good enough motivator to help a lot of you guys figure out how to play this game at a very high level. Yeah, I think, I mean, we, I mean, I never really got any lessons uh, as a kid and my kids have never really got, it. everybody always thinks like, oh, you must work with your kids all the time. No, I just go throw. I, I mean, I, I just throw to them and, you know, they, my oldest one obviously plays on some travel teams and he's got a great high school program, uh, Charlotte Country Day in, in Charlotte and, and great coaching staff there, but I've never really coached him at all. I just, you know, to me, the hitting part of it is figure out how to get the barrel on the ball and hit the ball as hard as you can, um, 
Most people, your natural throwing motion is going to be kind of your natural throwing motion. Um, none of my kids have been pitchers, thank God. My wife would say that. She always says, no. my daughters, if they ever marry a baseball player, she says, don't marry a pitcher. They're all crazy wives, <laughs> which is not true. But, but that's, uh, <laughs> so they, they, usually, they usually are a little bit different. But I've never, I've never done any of that. And, and as a kid, I never really had any lessons or anything. I mean, we played – games with, you know, socks rolled up and, and cups rolled up and, you know, half a bat, uh, whiff a ball, things like that, that we never had any of that. And I've never really pushed that on my kids at all. So we just, you know, we, we got whiff a ball and pick a ball and we're going to hit in the cage and, you know, just, just things like that. To me, that, that's the best way to do things until you get to a certain age where, you know, you get a little older and you're like, okay, this is going to get serious. Let's yeah, get fine the most too. out of it. Yeah. But I, I think he's like when I, they're 10, 12 years old and, and they're taking all these lessons and stuff. And uh, I don't know. It, 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 I mean, I think sometimes you can overdo it a little bit with kids and um, the game was meant to be fun. They call it a game. And I get frustrated sometimes watching younger kids play just because if a kid's not having fun, you can tell the kids that are there because their dad wants them to be there. And I understand you want to, to, to push them into some things, but you know, eventually you got to, let it, if the kid doesn't want to play baseball or he doesn't want to play hockey or, you know, you got to let him go. I mean, I wanted my older son to play hockey really bad. My wife's Canadian. We thought this is going to be great. He's going to be a hockey player, baseball, you know, hockey in the winter, baseball. We took him out there to skate a couple of times. It was not going to happen. He wanted no <laughs> part of it. And so we just walked away and said, I guess he's not going to play hockey. And, and yeah. he's never really skated in his life. So uh, that's just the way it goes. I mean, I've never pushed my kids. I think I was lucky because my dad never pushed me into anything. He always said, you guys want to play piano? You guys want to go be doctors? You want to be a lawyer? You want to be a teacher? You guys do what you want to do. Um, I'll help you with everything I can. And that's kind of what I've tried to do with my kids. And, um, you know, if they come and ask me something, heck yeah, I'm going to help. But I'm very rarely, if ever, go and say, hey, let's, let's do this. You should do this. Yeah, I think uh, right now in this times that, you know, we can't get out to a lot of places to go hit or do those things. This is a great time for these kids to go out and explore and play a little bit and, and you know, hit a sock ball, hit a wiffle ball, or, you know, like, you know, we use the max BP or we use some discs and, you know, high velocity, small wiffle balls and yeah. just work yeah. on their eye-hand coordination, their tracking skills, um, you know, even playing football. You know, I play football, soccer, baseball. And all those sports to me helped me, you know, a lot along the way. And then at one point I decided, you know what, I'm done. And that, yeah. that was my decision. I didn't choose to, to push it forward. But I think uh, if, if my recommendation is go out and just have fun, play, and it, and it is. It's a game. It's an enjoyable game. It's an opportunity to make some money, uh, some good money if you can make it all the way to that level. But you got to have the drive and, and the you know, the – the work ethic and, you know, uh, the plan to go and do it. And you got to get lucky too. I mean, I, I mean, not many, there's not many Bryce Harpers out there that are going to make it no matter what, you know, I mean, uh, Bryce was, you know, he's so talented and, and, you know, his work ethic and everything, he was going to make it. Um, but, you know, I think too many people look at their kids at a young age and say, they're going to make a career out of this. This is going to be their profession. And I'm kind of the opposite. I, I mean, I, I I look at things and say, this should be as fun as you can possibly have. Because I look back and I say, you know what? I had so much fun. I played football. I played basketball. I played baseball, whatever sport was going on. And I know it, you know, it's, it's changed now. And it's disappointing to me that, that, you know, some of the high schools are, uh, you know, being pushed to play one sport that high school coaches even, you know, which is disappointing. But, you know, I think you, you got to try to do as much as you can. Like, my son even didn't play basketball this winter. Uh, at his high school because he wanted to put on weight to, for college to get strong and everything. But he still went and played in a rec league and did things like that. So, I mean, it doesn't matter where you're playing, whether you're playing for your high school or whatever. I mean, just do different things. Like I said, I mean, I got – my boys are out here. They, you know, wiffle ball one day. We got a, we ordered a pickleball set uh, to play in the driveway. We got – you know, we're lucky because we have a little batting cage in the backyard. But, you know, hitting bottle caps or, you know, anything you can do uh, just, to, just to have fun. And, and I think that's – that's the biggest thing that I try to put on my boys um, and any kids that I'm ever working with uh, the young kids. Cause I, I used to do more lessons. I don't I haven't the last couple of years done that many lessons just because I want to see my boys kind of grow up and I don't want to be gone when they get home from school in the wintertime, I'm gone enough. Um, but I just try to impress upon them that, you know, have fun, man. If you're not having fun, then go do something else. Yeah, that's, that's good. 
you know, Dusty, uh, going back a little bit in the big leagues now, being a third base coach, what some people may realize or may not realize, being a minor league manager, you are a third base coach as well. In the minor league. So you've really been a third base coach for pretty much 14 years now. Um, what, uh, what does it take? And, and there was a question from someone about being a coach, but um, you know, what, what, what makes being a third base coach a good, you know, what, what do you have to do to be good at that? Or what are some cool you things? You have to have thick it? skin. You have to have really thick skin and not let the crowd dictate anything. Cause it's really easy, especially you get up in the big leagues or, you know, even triple A, you get 10,000 people and, Everybody wants that guy to score, especially here at home. Everybody wants a guy to score. So that the big thing is not to let, not get your emotions into what's happening at the time. Um, trust your instincts, what you know is right. Um, because you also have to remember all those people in the stands, they have no idea who's on deck. They have no idea who's after that. They have no idea if you're going to pinch it for the pitcher. Um, and you have to realize, and this is really hard. Um, it is tough when you get a guy thrown out, no matter what. It is, it, you take it hard. You take it personal. It's, I tell people coaching third base, especially in the big leagues is the closest thing you can get to playing still being an old guy. I mean, because I can actually physically affect a game one way or the other. So, I mean, you get a guy thrown out and you feel like you just struck out with the bases loaded. You feel terrible. And people, I mean, you just get crushed everywhere, but then you send a guy sometimes and you're like, he's getting thrown out. I know he's getting thrown out, but I'm going to take a chance because we have the pitcher on deck. I know he's going to hit whatever. And they make a bad throw. And you know, in your mind that that was a good decision because of what all the things that you went through. But if that guy gets thrown out, they're still going to crush you because they have no idea that you've watched two hours of video that you've um, went through all the guys throws, you know, um, you know, it, it just happens sometimes. You get caught up in the moment. But I think the hardest thing is is to – you have to have thick skin. You, you can't let one play affect the next play because um, you'll go into kind of like a slump thing. Yeah, you're I'm sure. Anybody. I think that goes back to even like the hitting side of things is, when you know, you have to move on. You know, you yeah. hear people talk about it is if you're caught up thinking about the last play, you're not recognizing or seeing the next play. And – for you as a third base coach, um, you, you probably, you know, if people put a, uh, a skull cap on you with uh, neuro tracking, uh, you know, ch checking all the stuff that's going on, you probably uh, have so much in your brain that's going on. It's like, okay, third baseman's playing here, pitcher's doing this, hitter's this, umpire's been like this, that right fielder's lagging today. But you have so many little things that you're planning that you have to make that instinctual decision right on the fly. It's not as easy as what people say sitting on the couch. And in fact, as I add to this, we got Lisa Costello on there, who's a big Philly fan that I'm going to call her out on this. She's probably the one sitting there yelling at you half the time why you didn't <laughs> let them score on there. That's all right. Uh, I mean, if Lisa's a true Philly fan, she probably is yelling at the TV yelling at me. That's fine. Uh, and I understand that. And it's probably one of the more difficult places to coach third base because Philly fans are tremendous. They are honest. I love it. I mean, I've been through, you know, I've got to play in the minor leagues with them. Um, so I was close, you know, we were up in, in Scranton and, and then managing and Reading for five years. And then, uh, you know, in Lehigh Valley, I know what Philly fans are all about and they just tell you the truth. And if you can't handle the truth, and I tell this to our players too, when I was managing the minor leagues, they would get upset when, when somebody would write something about them in the paper, you know, it said, you know, he struck out with the bases loaded and, and, you know, he's won for his last 20. And they would come and they'd be mad at me. You got to talk to this guy. And I would say, did you strike out with the bases loaded last night? Yeah. Are you one for your last 20? Yeah. I said, well, the guy's not lying. He's also going to write when you're 15 for your last 20 and you hit a home run with the bases loaded. So remember, you know, you have to be truthful with yourself. And I think that's the biggest thing that the Philly fans are. Um, and sometimes maybe they get a little bit on the negative side, <laughs> but you know what? They're, they're, they're tremendous. And, and I, that's, it makes it fun for me, but you do have to have thick skin. I'll tell you what, you, um, there's been days where, where you go home after a game and I felt like, you know, I felt terrible. But again, like you said, you have to bounce back the next day. You have to get right back on the horse. Um, you have to trust that, you know what, I know what I'm doing. I've done my, I've done all my homework. Um, you know, like I said, the video and all the R and D stuff we have and, uh, and things like that, that, um, you know, I did all I can. And, and sometimes we're going to make bad decisions. You know, Dusty, I, I got two more questions for you, and we'll wrap this up a little bit. But um, the first one, 
really we talk about this a lot for players and it's a common theme it's something that uh, my dad was teaching back in the 70s and people prior to that as well but is the role of visualization and picturing and i know uh your dad did a lot uh and i know you did a lot as a player but i'm curious because uh, i know we have some coaches on here as a coach what what I'm sure you spend a lot of time, especially when you take all that data, you're talking about those scenarios. Do you spend a lot of time visualizing yourself being in those situations? A lot, a ton, probably just as much as when I was playing, if not more, because now I'm visualizing for, you know, if I'm coaching third, I'm visualizing for trying to visualize every play that I, I could see happening before it's happening. You know, okay, if this ball hit to the left fielder and he has to go to his right, I know that I watched every throw that he makes when he has to go to his right. It's not as good a throw as if he, when he comes to his left or when he comes straight in. So I'm visualizing all those things that I've already seen. And, and, and here again, it comes with experience. You've seen things actually with your own eyes, but also we're lucky now with video and everything that I can go back and, you know, uh, watch everybody's throws and things like that. So I'm visualizing everything that I, that I can see happen um, all the time at third base and then going back, my, managing the minor leagues, you're visualizing how you plan on having the game full unfold before the game even starts. A lot of times you'll sit with your pitching coach and say, okay, we're going to figure out how this game's going to go. Okay, we're going to have the lead in the sixth. We're going to bring in this guy for an inning. This guy's going to come in for two innings, and this guy's, this guy's going to end it for us. And then you're visualizing that through the rest of the game, and you have to change on the fly. But now I need another vision. i got to look and see, okay – that didn't work out. Now, how are we going to change this? So you're visually trying to watch um, and think of all these things. Uh, and I think I do a good job of, of doing it visually in my head and mentally picturing things and how they're going to work out. Um, yeah, it's just kind it, of the way my brain doing, works. You're, you're storyboarding. And you did this as, as a player. You learned it as a kid. And you applied it. And I, and I do, you know, I bring this up in the end, but this could probably be a full hour conversation right here, is – the managers that are the best, the coaches that are best, they are probably they are some of the better visualizers, and that's why I think catchers are do such a good job. It's because they're forced as a catcher to visualize different pitches, different scenarios, that they're a lot easier to be able to apply that in the game. And then at the same time, the better visualizer you are, the better your reactor you are on the fly of what's what ha when it happens live. Yeah, and and I think that's a good point. I think I think everything happens so fast in a game, and at every level, it gets faster and faster. Um, and I think as a catcher, you're, you're used to that. And, and luckily for me, I got to every level and, and you can see how it got faster. And then you sit in a dugout in, in the New York Penn league, you know, low a ball, and it's not that fast for a guy that's played, but you get to the big leagues and you would be surprised. It's supposed to be the same amount of time, but things happen really fast in the major leagues. And people sit on their couch and say, how did they miss that? How did they miss this? And the good managers don't miss very much and the things they do miss have a tremendous bench coach, which is why he's there because he's there to back everything up. And it's just for whatever reason, things go fa They happen faster in the big leagues. And, and to me, experience is the only way to, to help with that speed. And it's really, it's a really hard thing to, to explain to people about the speed of the game. Um, but not only the speed of the game during the game, but what's happening in the dugout, it, it goes fast. Yeah. And that's why, you know, obviously we talk about slowing the game down. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, no as doubt. Much as we talk about players, it's for coaches and managers too. And it's how they pick up the, the, the concise visual information and able to make quick decisions based off what they see. Yeah. Yes, for sure. You know, um, like I said, we could probably talk about visualization for an hour, but uh, we do have a question from Drew. Um, who has the best routine for hitting or does the exact routine – doesn't really matter just that you have one um so for me i think reese hoskins has one of the better routines and I, i've been around reese for five years or so now so um maybe i've seen his routine a lot but he has a really really good routine um harper has a really really good routine and it, it does matter um the routine i think but you have to be able to adjust your routine to make sure that you're ready for it's going to happen. I mean, we'll talk about baseball for now. So Harper has a thing that he is ready so early for the game in his full uniform. It's crazy. You think like guys, when they first are around him, they'll think his routine is just to be ready with everything on. And then he goes down and hits in his uniform in the cage. But you'll think like when I was first there, 
the first two weeks of the season, I said, is the game at six or seven? And they're like, no, it's at seven. I'm like, it's, it's 540 and he's got his full uniform. What's going on? So he and I got into a routine. It was pretty funny. I would always try to beat him with my uniform on. And, and when we're on the road, obviously we're on the field doing stuff and we couldn't, I could never beat him. And on the road, I, I would, he would come in and he'd say, oh, gotcha again or whatever. I said, some of us have to be out to work. You've been in here just hanging out, eating before the game for a while. But um, I think, I think it's, it's, it's being able to have a routine and then be able to adjust off that routine. But Reese Hoskins, um, he's pretty impressive with what he does, not only hitting side of it, but you know, the time he gets to the ballpark, how many hours before the game, when he does his weight training, when he eats, all those things are, are, are pretty impressive. That's awesome. You know, it reminds me of myself as a kid, uh, my routine at playing youth soccer was put my uniform on the night before. <laughs> I think some days, so I, so we have these coaches clinics about seven times a year, right? In Philly. And they do, I think we do them at nine o'clock for a one o'clock game, or it might be eight 30 or something, but it's, you know, none of the players are there yet. Cause we don't usually hit on the field during day games. So the one day we're done at like nine 30 or something. And Harp would come to the game ballpark, maybe at, maybe like 10, 10, 30 or whatever. So I put my full uni on and I just sat there next to right next to his locker. And he walked in, he goes, are you kidding me? This doesn't count. I think you slept in it. So that reminds me of, <laughs> well, that you, reminds me of, of you. You probably used to sleep in them on those uh, Reading uh, third shift games, right? Yeah, and that's right. Yeah, nine, uh, what is it? Eight 30 in the morning or something like that? In the yeah, morning games. Pretty close. I can remember sleeping in my uniform as uh, well, they call them the father kid games there. Now it's the family, family, family kids. But, um, as a little kid, we got full on Wilson came in and fitted us for uniforms and we had a father son game every year. And, and, uh, I can remember sleeping in that thing. Yeah. And a couple of quick questions, Dust, if you don't mind, um, question, uh, do you believe we should be teaching kids in youth baseball level to bunt? He's, I'm seeing that the anti bunt movement happening. I'm curious to hear your topic. if youth baseball coaches should be focusing their efforts to teach the kids to bunt or not. Um, I guess youth meaning dependent on the age, really. Um, I like the game of baseball and I, I, I kind of see it coming back a little bit, um, back to some more stolen bases. I think you saw, like, I just saw last year, some more hit and runs against us. Cause I'm in charge of running the, uh, pickoffs and, and pitch outs and things like that. Uh, so Lisa can yell at me too, if, if, if guys are safe, but last year we were pretty good at JT, but, um, you know, I've seen more like, the Don Manley, the uh, Miami hit and runs a lot, uh, Washington hit and runs some, there's some teams going back to that, but I guess going back to the bunting part of it is I don't want my kids bunting at all as kids. Um, now once they start to get into middle school, high school, um, depending on the player that you are, you need to learn how to bunt. Um, I learned how to bunt, uh, in college, that was one of our stations. We bunted for 15 minutes every day. Um, but I think once you get to the high school level, maybe middle school, you need to learn how to bunt for sure. I, I think there's, there's too many advantages uh, to, to being able to have that in your pocket. Um, I remember, I mean, a big, slow, fat guy like myself, I was 10 for 10 in 1999 in the double A in bunts, on singles. And I had 279 that year, maybe. And if I don't get those 10 for 10, I'm probably hitting 240. So, yeah. I mean, the third baseman would play way back and, I'll take a free hit. I mean, I, I think I, the bunting thing is funny because people don't think it's smart, but you talk to pitchers and they hate it when runners are on base. So if you can get on base somehow, uh, especially in situations, I mean, you know, people don't want Bryce Harper uh, bunting all the time, but there's a time and a place for it. If we're down by two in the ninth inning and he can get on base, I think we'd like him to get on base instead of hit a solo homer and lose the ball game. Yeah. You know, um, you know, it's funny you say that about those pitchers, too. I mean, it, there, there's a lot of, you know, you can battle e either side of this. But even the pitchers thinking that you're going to bunt, you have that as a weapon, that's a challenge for them to go, oh, I got to get off the mound. And, you are and you know, you're playing that game against the pitcher. If you have the pitcher thinking, you know, that, that's part of a win right there. I think so, that's, that's one side of the game that, that, that I still really believe in the, the – the, Numbers and the analytics part of the game are, are very important, um, but you have to blend that with things because there's so many guys that get upset about things like that, that they're not robots out there. It's not going to happen the same way every single day. So if, if you can um, disrupt the pitcher as a hitter with, you know, just a bunt, uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's something. So I think once they get to a certain age, you know, I think 
to, to incorporate it a little bit, it's, it's good. Yeah. Um, again, we probably talked about just a couple quick things here. Um, and this can be brief on you. How long uh, do you think long toss for development of arm strength for 13 year olds? No doubt. Best thing in the world to, to is play catch, uh, the, to get your arm stronger, play catch. I'm, I'll give you a quick example. My son was a freshman in high school, good arm. Um, I had Pat Venditti that throws with both arms, right, in, in AAA. Yeah. And Pat needs two throwing partners, right? So my son's traveling with us. So he went and threw with Pat for three months as his left-handed throwing partner. And he realized right away when he got back to school how much his arm got so much stronger because of that. And it was – he had to do it because Pat grabbed him every day. Here, I need somebody to play catch with. And so – it took that for him to realize, wow, I need to play catch. And that's the best thing you can do to make your arm stronger, in my opinion. Yeah. One last thing here, uh, as a catcher, uh, since you're a catcher, um, you know, we use the Max BP, and they, they help sponsor this, this show for us with a small wiffle ball. You remember the little wiffle ball machine? Yeah, yeah. About yeah. That? Um, Do you see value in receiving small wiffle balls on a machine like the Max BP as a catcher and then putting a mid on catching live from a visual standpoint? So we've never, I've never used the Max – BP for the catching part of it. We have used small wiffle balls. Um, I don't. I definitely don't think it can hurt, but we've never used them. We do different different things with different uh, machines and stuff. Uh, I think uh, Jorge Alfaro used to do where we used to throw them at him. We never used the machine, but he yeah. used to do a thing with with the with the small wiffle balls for that. So I mean, I don't. I don't think it hurts. I, I think yeah. anything. You know, I think John, you need to train John above. Buck, John Buck. Created, John Buck created a little web. That went yeah. right through here. And so he would use it as, you know, with his web. So he's working on, on, on that small stuff. Um, yeah. So aim small, miss small is really what, what you're trying to do. And I think, uh, you know, whether it's hitting, whether it's fielding, whether it's um, you know, working with small balls that constrain it is a very valuable uh, thing to help people focus a little bit more because you, you can't focus on technique if you're looking for a smaller target. Right. So we use, we use the smaller glove, the, the training glove. I think Wilson and Rawlings make them and we used a, you know, a smaller ball at times. Um, but we do use high velocity. So, you know, or, or, or the velocity doesn't have to be high. I guess it's just, it's just the, um, the perception of the velocity has to be higher. I think, I think that's one thing we've learned uh, for sure now is that training at a higher level, uh, or at least perceived velocity is, is a huge thing. And I know that's helped our catchers tremendously is, is even we do a thing where we crank up the machine as high as it'll go and we get behind a net and they won't just so they don't get the pounding in their hand and they'll just practice catching the ball as it's there. And it's similar to, you know, like the light, light board that you're, you know, your dad going way back that your light yeah. dad had and stuff. And we have some stuff like that still, but um, I think, I mean, the max BP, I loved hitting off that thing. Um, I think, you know, there's, it definitely is not going to hurt you. It can only help you trying to catch those things. Good luck. Though. That's, that's some work. Yeah. Awesome. Dusty, you got anything else you want to add? No, I just, uh, hopefully we can get back to playing and I don't have to do these zoom things anymore. I love you, Ryan. I love doing stuff like this, but you know, I want to get back to coaching third base. I agree. I mean, it's, uh, I like to get out there and start training people and, and doing things. It's been fun uh, having these conversations with pe with different players on, on stuff, but man, I'm not a talker. I'd rather go have some fun and do something. You know? I hear you. I, I'm, I'm right with you. So hopefully we can get, uh, get going in the next two, three weeks. Sounds like things are starting to get a little bit better and uh, everybody keep their fingers crossed and we can get some baseball. Yeah. I'll, you know, again, real quick, I just want to thank you for, for j jumping on and, and, uh, you know, I, I always enjoy being around you, Dusty. I wish we had more time to, to hang out and, uh, and, and be around each other. But, um, you know, thank you again for coming. And thanks for Max BP for putting us on and, and Neurodynamic Vision. And one of the things we're doing in the future is we got some uh, – uh, we're actually working on now is academy, online academy training and coaching for certifications of ideas like that at academy.ndvperformance. And then we got some uh, – I got Reggie Smith coming on next week. And I got Grant Fear coming in this Friday on there. So a lot of great, uh, great information from some great uh, players and people have been around the game for a long time. And Dusty, someone uh, I could probably do a full hour show with your dad as well. And yeah. probably a five hour show with you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Appreciate it, Dusty. Thanks for your time. Thanks, guys. Everyone have a good, have a good rest of the day. Thank you.